Hello, everyone, and welcome to Wholesale Change, the webcast and podcast from Distribution Strategy Group, where we provide thought leadership for wholesale change agents like you. Because if you're on this show, you probably are a wholesale change agent. We encourage, encourage questions. We try to get to all of them. So please don't be shy about using that Q&A button. So my name is Ian Heller. I'm with Distribution Strategy Group, and I'm joined today by my business partner. He's the ace of analytics and the doctor of distribution. Jonathan Bynum, PhD, and also a special guest. Uh, we have with us Steve Ruane from iMark. Steve, how are you today? Doing well, thank you. Great. And Jonathan, how are you, my friend? Always happy to be here. <laughs> Outstanding. Well, I'm glad that you both are here. We appreciate you joining us. So, um, so Steve, uh, what we're going to do now is, I think, hand it over to you. To, why don't you, you know, tell us exactly what you do at iMark and give us an overview of the organization. We'll get some, and, and we'll, you know, throw you some questions as we get them. Uh, then we have a bunch of a bunch of questions to pitch to pitch but pass by you as well. Okay, so the, the the floor is yours. All right, thank you, gentlemen. So again, my name is Steve Ruane. My job title is Vice President of Marketing for iMark Electrical. IMARC Group is a member-owned, member-governed uh, marketing group uh, serving distributors and manufacturers in the electrical, the HVACR, and the plumbing and irrigation industries. Our mission is to increase the profitability of our member distributors while providing above average rates of market performance and market share to the manufacturers that, that we partner with. Uh, we've got about 2,500 member companies operating thousands of locations in the U.S. and Canada. And um, we have over 5,000 locations generating about $28 billion worth of collective sales wow. in 2019. So that's I'm my, my job. I'm responsible for our marketing programs, our meetings, our communications, and providing support for those of our members who are marching down the path of proficiency and capability in the world of e-commerce. That's my story. <laughs> That's great. And uh, the services that uh, iMark offers to its members, I mean, in a nutshell, what are the, what, what's the service menu? Why do people join? Well, I think they, historically, you know, the independent distributor, and I do mean independent, um, you know, I think benefits from having an alliance and being part of a group where their peers and colleagues are fighting the battles and winning many of them every single day. Um, our primary mission is to engage on their behalf with the leading manufacturers in our industry and then encourage them to work very closely together. So my mom always told me, play with the A students. So when you put electrical wholesalers together that are independent and market leaders in various parts of the country, and then you put tools in place to engage and enhance relationships between those distributors, manufacturers, and their reps, uh, you're gonna get some good results. And that is what we see year after year. We're very much driven toward a win-win uh, relationship. And uh, we found that that's a formula for success. Yeah, so when you go to your website, there's a section that says for distributors, another one that's for suppliers, or something like that, right? Right, yes. And, and so, on the supplier side, the, I mean, it would seem that, I mean, this isn't just like hammering them on price, right? There's, there's a, there are real benefits to suppliers to, to joining. I mean, I know that you guys have a, have a heavy duty focus on training, but what's the value proposition for suppliers? Well, I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, you hear the term buying group, marketing group. And in right. fact, we're a marketing group. A buying group would be involved in negotiating pricing and getting involved in actual purchases and so forth. And of course, we do nothing of the sort. Uh, we're basically a platform, a machine, uh, which is designed to uh, build on the strengths that our member distributors have and providing an unlevel playing field for the manufacturers so they get more access to quality time with those distributors to the extent that um, you know, the distributors, when using our programs, become a more effective advocate and partner uh, for that manufacturer and the reps. And uh, again, it's blocking and tackling, making sure that these folks are front and center on both sides of the equation. And when that happens, uh, we do generate positive results. There's a natural symbiotic relationship between, for example, agency reps and the independent distributor. That's very important and something that we exploit as part of our culture because there are programs and resources 
you know, whether training, marketing, promotions, communications tools uh, that are designed for and placed in the hands of um, all of the channel partners, whether they're reps, whether they're manufactured direct, uh, and of course, our member distributors. And uh, I know you're heavily involved in training and there are lots of pictures of conferences with training going on. So what's the traditional cadence and organization for training look like? How have you had to adopt it, ad adopt that in during the COVID era? And to what degree are you going to go back when it's over? Well, traditionally, we have two meetings a year, which are face to face. I wouldn't say training was necessarily a big part of that. The uh, the kinds of people who come to our meetings tend to be senior mm -hmm. uh, executives uh, and or influential purchasing procurement people. Um, so the ex to the extent that we do train, it is based uh, on our iMark University online platform. And uh, it primarily consists of content related to products, applications, how to sell exclusively uh, for use by our suppliers, which is another way we develop stickiness and brand awareness for the manufacturers. At the same time, our members are learning important uh, aspects of products, which makes them more effective with our customers. So primarily online. Okay. Uh, of course, 2020 was a banner year for online training with a dislocation of people uh, due to the pandemic and so forth. We had, I think, 300,000 course sessions completed. So it's a very popular resource. And um, yeah, when we when we find our find a successful uh, resource that resonates with our members, that's something for us to build on, and we we continue to do that. So uh, we talk a lot about disruption. You know, there are companies like Home Depot, which, you know, obviously has become a significant MRO distributor um, and to some degree electrical for mostly small residential accounts. And then you've got Amazon business and you know, Google's got a, a marketplace and Walmart's got a marketplace. So, you know, distributors getting are getting pushed from outside forces. Now, it feels to me like a natural response to that for distributors would be to collaborate, which is really what your organization offers, right? So when you say $28 billion in revenue, that's significant by anybody's standards. Are you seeing any different level of interest in joining your organization? Or are you thinking about how you change your value proposition in light of this outside pressure? Not really. I mean, you know, I think the the pandemic has pointed out the resilience of electrical wholesale distributors. I'll speak about that group in particular. Um, you know, you hear the words of, you know, you, you hear the words resilient, innovative, and frankly, you know, one could expect that there would have been a lot more people just raising the white flag in 2020 and, and, you know, trying to cash out or sell. And we saw very, very little of that. Uh, you know, we believe our members outperform the market, you know, and in terms of um, distribution in general, you know, a lot of the punditry, not you guys, of course, but, you know, I think that not enough credit is given to the relationship between the local independent electrical distributor and those contractors and installers. I mean, there is a lot of value, a lot of stickiness there. And, you um, you know, and I think other also people tend to underestimate the complexities of servicing the construction market. Right. You know, it is a very challenging animal and wholesale distribu distributors and our members do it very, very well. And to some, to, to some extent, you know, it is a barrier to entry. Um, and I think it buys time for people to make the kind of investments in e-commerce and other kind of outside the box alternatives that they might not have considered five, 10 years ago. So that's a roundabout way of saying, yeah, I think people are, will be willing to consider uh, potentially ways to collaborate. But again, that key word is independent and yeah. they have to decide after a careful vetting of whatever alternative is put before them that they're gonna generate incremental profitable sales uh, when they do that as a trade-off for potential lock, uh, lessening of control over the customer relationship. So I think that goes into the mindset 
of people who are looking at these types of things and also for people like an IMARC who wants to make sure that whatever we put in, uh, uh, put in place that we have the best possible handle on unintended consequences uh, from things like marketplaces. And that, that uh, you know, we just really kind of understand the directions where these things can go from a pro and con standpoint. So, yeah, so you brought up marketplaces and uh, there are, nobody, you know, nobody really knows how big Amazon business is because even though it's probably 20, 25 billion or, or so, it doesn't trigger the 10% of sales profits or assets requirement so that they have to disclose it to the SEC, right? So, which is hard to believe, right? I mean, anybody else, other distributors have a $30 million division, they have to disclose it, but just because the law is based on percentage, Amazon doesn't, uh, which is, you know, if I were Amazon, I wouldn't do it either. Um, but, you know, we know they're big, right? We also know that their sales are split among every vertical. So their specific impact on individual verticals is pretty small. And I agree with you, anything related to the construction process is a lot more complicated because you've got, you know, bid submittals and all this other stuff that, that makes it a different transaction than just, you know, check out with a credit card. Um, now, having said that, marketplaces are popping up all over the place. You know, there's a company called Miracle that we've worked with, and they're putting marketplaces in. You got distributors building their own marketplaces, whether it's Granger or um, uh, DigiKey, or uh, I think it's Arrow Electronics that's got one. Is that right, Jonathan? Is it Arrow? Yes. Um, and so, you know, it begs the question: is is there a place for an industry or distributor-centric marketplace? not for all transactions, but for those tailspin transactions. And, you know, if so, is an organization like IMARC, uh, you know, a good fit as a coordinator for that? Not, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, Steve, or ask you to disclose any, any secret plans, but, you know, generally speaking, how do you think through the evolution of marketplaces and distribution and whether or not there's a role for IMARC in it? Well, I think that from the standpoint of a fulfillment network, any a fulfillment network made up of distributors and the electrical, HVAC, plumbing uh, markets in the U.S. and Canada would be very difficult to beat. Mm -hmm. uh, what you're talking about with the marketplace is essentially creating a new company, okay, one single company that would be, you know, positioned against an Amazon Business Services and a Granger or some of these other marketplaces. So, what does that marketplace represent you know how do the members engage with that are they threatened that uh, you know would they be threatened by it would they be encouraging their people to market it you know very aggressively um, would it be a life raft for some people where hey good i have now a repository where people can order um you know materials and i'll get to service some of that like maybe if i was subscribing as a provider to amazon instead of doing that you've got this marketplace so again, um, you know, most of the mistakes I've made in, in my career or my life for that matter have been thinking that, you know, I got a really good idea and this is something that should make a lot of sense to everybody. In fact, it's a no brainer. And, uh, you know, you can find out pretty quickly in this business uh, when you go down a path that isn't consistent with the way people see things, yeah. much less people that are very large, very medium sized or very small companies. So again, rambling a little bit, but to answer your question is yes. I mean, it could potentially be uh, a very important asset for a, a group like IMARC. Uh, but, you know, before you go down that path, you really need strong leadership within the membership uh, who decide that, you know what, this is not only a good thing for us, but it may be a vital tool for us. And so that's the kinds of things that we would, we would look at. We got a lot of smart people in our group um, and people who have a history of sharing ideas, dealing with, uh, you know, common problems and so forth and so on. So, um, yeah, I mean, we'd be remiss not to be looking at this and putting something in front of our members that they can weigh in on. Right. So the, I, think, so I think one of the one of the ideas that's that's powerful in terms of where IMARC is positioned is when we look at the disruptors like well, let's just say Amazon. Now, there's nobody like Amazon. When we look at Amazon, they are digital only, right? But part of the power that you have with your how many locations was it? Several thousand. 
Well, in the electrical alone, it's 3,000. And okay. I think you have two, over 2,000 collectively. Yeah, so you've got several thousand locations across the, the sectors that you have. So you have got proximity in a way that Amazon does not. And there are things that your members can do for their customers that Amazon is ill positioned to do. So I think you know the, 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 the part of the power in, if you're able to create something like a marketplace, I'm not advocating, I'm not giving counsel, but part of the power could be, yeah, we have the digital thing and we also have the proximity thing. And that's gonna position us well against this highly disruptive force named Amazon. Yeah, I wouldn't disagree at all. I think, you know, when I was, I, I used to run marketing for White Cap Construction Supply when it was a division of HD Supply. And we would have people say, well, there's only 150 White Cap locations. There are 2,200 Home Depots, right? So how do you compete with that? Or my reply was, well, yeah, but we're on thousands and thousands of construction projects a day. Home Depot's not. I mean, we have account trained account managers who understand the construction process, who are at the customer's place of business, which, you know, so that's not a store, that's actually being with the customer. And one of the things we've been thinking about, Steve, is, is there a way that distributors can start working out? How do you add more value with every sales call, right? I mean, first of all, the, I think the old line about how, well, you can't just deliver donuts anymore, is kind of a red herring, because mm -hmm account managers do, who didn't do anything but deliver donuts were never successful, right? But for, but, you know, is there, is there a way you can get, do even more consultative selling? Um, and I don't know if this is something that iMark participates in or not, but, you know, I mean, Amazon doesn't take phone calls. They don't make sales calls in a real sense. So, I mean, how do you leverage those assets as a distributor or as a group of distributors so that you're, you know, tightening up those relationships and adding more value every day with every phone call and every visit to a job site or to a customer in ways that disruptors can't. Do you guys think about that kind of stuff? Well, yes. And by the way, just, just to be clear to your audience, and I'm sure they know this, you know, there's a big difference between a marketing group and a distributor. So, yes, right. you know, some of my observations are just that, you know, I've had the opportunity to work with some really smart people and, and listen to them. Um, I think the premise of the question is kind of interesting, especially in the, in the uh, you know, as we come out of this pandemic, God willing, I mean, the whole idea of personal selling, um, I think has been kind of in an upheaval. And, um, you know, I, I think that this, uh, the remote selling that has gone on will continue to play a very important role moving forward. And I think that the justification for a face-to-face -face meeting uh, is going to change. Uh, we are putting together, so in other words, we we'll see a convergence between sales and marketing where a sales rep, uh, in effect, needs to be an effective marketer. They need to be able to command um, and, and be skilled in reaching people in a variety of different ways and to deliver, you know, relevant information that helps them in their jobs. Now, specifically to that, you know, we're creating a section of our website called Digital Selling Assets. And that is gonna be a kind of a repository for content from our manufacturers. And it may include, you know, information on products, links to a product website, um, the, uh, you know, maybe apps, configurators, things that a member sales or marketing person could view, download, and then pass along in a high quality fashion to customers, once again, uh, displaying their value and particularly they, as they understand the needs of that particular customer and, and matching up that information with that customer. So um, I guess I forgot the original question other than to say, um, I think the sales profession, and not just in our industry, but in every profession, is changed irrevocably. Yeah. But I, I heard something really interesting in there, uh, several things, by the way, but one I want to focus on, Stephen, which is you talked about these other sort of applications. So a, a lot of the industry focus has been how do we get revenue to go through the shopping cart? How do we get people to visit our site? Um, and look at our product content. What I hear you saying is there's more in the digital realm than just shopping and putting stuff in a shopping cart. 
Is that well, right? And I have I have seen your studies on shopping versus buying. And um, I think that is extremely relevant to wholesale distribution. I still think that, you know, based on the complexity of what these people are trying to buy, uh, they will use the web store to, you know, look at various aspects of the relationship, pricing, stock, availability, and then frankly, nine times out of 10, pick up the phone and, or communicate via email to their local uh, customer service rep or inside salesperson and, get the ball rolling on the order. So to that standpoint, that to me does not diminish in what, in any way, shape or form an e-commerce store, you know, mm -hmm. a web, a web store. Um, but it does provide that website of the distributor with the opportunity to, to pro, uh, provide information. Okay. In depth code related relevant information to people who visit that site for product, but also to learn. And of course that builds and reinforces the reputation of the distributor as the go-to authority for everything electrical or plumbing or HVAC or whatever it happens to be. And I think a lot of our members are getting very, very good at that and using social media to tie it all together. I've been very impressed and very proud uh, to see the work that has been done by small, medium and large companies to upgrade uh, their ability to serve customers using these new tools. And I, I think once they get into it and begin to have dialogues with their customers about what's important to them, uh, it becomes more, um, more beneficial and more rewarding for the people putting these tools in place. And we're starting to see that. And that's very encouraging. What, what are you seeing in social media, Steve? I'm intrigued to hear you say that. What are, are they, you know, they're doing marketing promotions, doing research. What are they doing? You know, I think all of them up. I mean, new products, sales promotions, um, events, um, polls, um, things of that nature. I mean, anything that, uh, you know, anything that they think is, is going to be important to their customer. And, and keep in mind, these are very strong relationships. And uh, social media is a two-way street. You know, you're not going to be participating unless you have interest. And I think that's one of those things that, you know, to the extent the tool is used to extract feedback uh, from your customers, it, it over time will become a very, very important way of communicating and sharing useful information in a very cost-effective way. Excellent, good. So I'd like to encourage people again to ask questions. You can use the Q&A button or the chat button. Um, and what do you think is the, you know, sort of the future state of, a group like uh, like I Mark. I mean, in, I mean, it's been how long? By the way, how long has I Mark been around? Well, I Mark has kind of rolled with the punches. I mean, we, the seeds of the group were on the electrical side back in 1968 with an organization called MAED, Mid Atlantic Electrical Distributors, and then there was a, a basically uh, marketing groups in this industry. Our industry uh, were regional. Okay, so. As the industry continued to consolidate, these regional entities kind of came together, the South, the East, the West, all of them had marketing groups, all culminating in 1998 with a formation of um, IMARC. So IMARC Electrical has been around since, you know, 1968 for all intents and purposes, but the IMARC group as it exists today is a couple years old with the multiple, multiple verticals. So uh, we have a couple of questions in. So Vicky wants to know, what are your thoughts around texting promotions to customers and using a platform for texting essentially? I think good. I mean, I, I think ultimately it's, it's, it's getting a, a handle on the way your customers want to receive information. And, uh, you know, I, I think you can get a pretty quick idea based on the response to a campaign, regardless of the platform, as to whether it's resonating. And of course, any communications that are done uh, should have measurement techniques in place so you can fine tune, tweak, or just abort altogether, depending on how your customers respond and what kind of results you're getting. But generally speaking, I would say, you know, why not? Yeah, the only it's thing I would say. Well, I'll just say be careful because some these are subject to state laws. Don't text people in California. That <laughs> I mean, 
just be careful, particularly in California, because you can get yourself crosswise with st some state laws on texting. Yeah, there are definitely can spam like things that apply to texting and yeah. there are places where opt in is required as opposed to opt out. Um, that being said, um, we just got noticed that the marketing automation platform we use has got a, which is primarily for email, right? And also for inbound stuff now has a texting component. Right. Um, and so Vicky, to your question, for some reason, I've seen a number of companies in HVAC uh, I haven't yet seen an electrical or plumbing, but maybe it's there, but I've seen a number in HVAC use uh, texting very successfully. Um, and so uh, Rick wants to know, based on Steve's dialogue, does the value of an outside salesman diminish? Uh, not in my view. No, not at all. Um, you know, it's, it's just like everything else in life. You know, it evolves, it changes. Um, I think it's... You know, these industries, all of these industries have the opportunity to provide very important innovations, suggestions for efficiency, um, better working places. And, um, you know, people in facilities around this country greatly value uh, the knowledge and the expertise of outside salespeople. I do think, of course, that the, you know, the stereotype about you know, the standard milk run, checking in on somebody every Tuesday. I mean, I don't even know if that's relevant anymore, but that's something you, you, you hear mm -hmm. people doing. And you know, I think that there's probably um, less of a demand um, for that type of thing. So, hey, guess what? It's like everything else. It's all about learning and figuring out how you're going to add value. And there's no reason why people in the sales can have a very interesting, rewarding and lucrative career. Yeah, so this is uh, relevant to another question. So Gil wants to know, um, Steve, can you expand on value-added services, in particular, looking to innovate with customers to improve their products? This will be for product innovation, but, but let's broaden it. I mean, generally speaking, you, you know, so the, there's this notion that distributors mostly help the procurement process and the supply room, right, or the, the inventory process is there a way that, or do you have examples of distributors who go past that and actually help with core business processes, whether it's, you know, uh, you know, product development, or maybe it's, you know, uh, I mean, we all know electrical distributors who have done energy audits and which was re resulted in relamping projects or better lighting or cost savings or some combination of the three. And, or, or I know Jonathan, you talked to us, a, 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 a a distributor and they know the codes for the local products that in the state codes, right? So they, then they can provide expert advice. So some of that more consultative value added selling beyond I'll restock your bins, not that there's anything wrong with restocking bins. But I think the heart of the question is, do you see distributors making progress towards going past just the logistics and purchasing functions and helping more in the plant or the, well, or the environment? To an extent, um, you know, we have, you know, I know of a member who is committed to have 20% of the revenues being generated by services provided within five years and working it every year to get to that point. So, wow. you know, I would say that that would be an exception uh, rather than the rule. Um, typical selling or charging for services kind of like is like the third rail of a distributor organization, particularly as it relates to, um, you know, their sales force. You know, it gets very hinky about walking in and saying, hey, you know, that stuff we've been doing for you for 10 years, uh, well, it now cost X. Right, right. Um, having said that, um, you know, I think the companies that will turn out to be uh, the market share gainers will be people who have an in-depth understanding of their customer to the point where they can walk in and have a financial discussion about the things that we do and would like to keep on doing for you at the same time, the contractor has a better appreciation for, you know, what, how their valued supplier makes it a living. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, we've encouraged our members, if nothing else, put down a menu of services that you provide today for your customers and start to wrap your mind around the idea of whether every single one of your customers is worthy of these types of things at no cost. Mm. And I think people are doing that. Uh, they don't need, need me to tell them how to do it, 
but uh, you know, at some point, you know, there, there, there should be a business discussion about what it takes to be a, a provider. We've had some uh, distributors who have taken the electric out of their name. Okay. Hmm. They want to be, you know, Jones and why? Because they don't necessarily want to be linked to just a provider of product. What they are, in fact, is a consultative partner in the installation and maintenance of lighting and other important electrical equipment. And there's a cost for that. Like you talk about training and knowledge and codes and all those types of things. And there's and, and should be people getting rewarded for that. Um, I would say yes, but it takes strong leadership at the top. Um, and very good, candid relationships between distributors and their customers uh, to make that happen so that it turns out to be good for both parties. Yeah, I love that notion of, you know, we want to get X percentage of our revenue out of services over some period of time. And I, and I don't know which numbers are right, but I think, you know, unless you set a goal like that, it's not going to happen organically. You have to drive it, right? It's like anything else. Yeah. So uh, Jim wants to know, Steve, will your digital selling assets uh, section live on the iMark site or could customers go to the distributors to get that? I think the concern here is that, is there a way the member distributor can attach that, can tap that archive, but keep the customers on their site rather than leaving their site? Uh, the assets will be available to the members on the iMark portal. Okay. So a member distributor could go and review the menu of these assets and determine whether they are in the sales or marketing function, whether they, that information uh, would be interesting to their customers. And they'll be able to extract it and communicate it in any way they see fit. Including putting it on their, on their website? Uh, certainly, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, good. Um, so... Uh, Let's see, that's it for quest for questions from the audience for now, although we'll probably get some more in. I have ahead, a big John. broad question, Ian. Yep. So Steve, um, scale matters in this decade and going forward, right? And there's there's an idea that there's gonna be some level of consolidation um, of companies that are unable to scale into this decade. On the on the topic of scale, 28 billion is is pretty big in terms of scale. How do you think about, or even do you think about, harnessing the scale of what you have to compete against Home Depot, Amazon, big players? Is is there a way that you try to harness uh, the power of all the members, or is it, or is it more of a loose federation? Well, you know, I'll give you an example. So, as an organization the leadership of iMark Electrical came to the conclusion that it was very important for our members to be proficient in uh, serving customers using e-commerce tools up to and including a uh, web store with attributed high quality data. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem for a lot of the members was that, you know, hey, they're good at buying, they're good at selling, they're great at customer service, technology, e-commerce was not a particular strong suit. So what we did is we pulled together a group of people and we called it the Futures Committee. And we developed a roadmap with specific milestones, um, which reflected the attributes of a distributor who was market leading in terms of e-commerce uh, capabilities, competencies, and resources. And the members had two and a half years to achieve these uh, criteria. And when they did, they earned a five figure payout from iMark. Um, basically the, the board of directors said, you know what, this is important to us that our members step up because uh, you can't protect your ability to buy if you don't protect your ability to sell. So that's a, an example of how the group came together. And I think in a very unselfish way and took resources and put a deadline on members who were interested in moving forward. Because what we see, of course, is that inertia is the strongest force on the planet. And distributors who you know, grow 5%, 6%, 7% every year, year after year. And oh, by the way, we did it all without e-commerce. 
and no one's asking us, okay? But in their heart of hearts, they probably recognize, look, if we're gonna be in this business long-term, we're gonna to need to serve customers who wanna be served with these resources. So that was a very successful example of how we harnessed uh, the membership and the power of the membership, not only to define attributes of a market leading e-commerce capability, but also to put a deadline, hold people's feet to the fire, and then money and investment in, in uh, rewarding those people who did move forward. And as I said earlier, you know, we see these submittals and, um, you know, it's just amazing what these folks can do, especially with the cost of technology dropping as it is. It's, it's, it's very interesting. So as far as, um, you know, aggregating or, um, it's just something that has to be done very, very carefully because the brand equity and the, and the value of the local distributor, um, you know, for us to interfere with that, there needs to be a very, very good reason. It needs to be driven by the membership. Yeah, I, I like what you said earlier where, I mean, I've had those no brainer ideas in my lifetime too, where I just couldn't imagine why everyone else didn't see what a brilliant idea it was and it never worked out. And I realized it wasn't a no brainer. It was brainless. I just didn't know it at the time. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, and uh, uh, so I think, you know, you, you want to, you want to make sure that you're responding to members needs and not trying to talk them into things that they don't see the need for, because it wouldn't work anyway. Right. Absolutely. Um, um, so we do have another question. This is from Larry. He says, uh, this is a bit of a business trend question, I guess. Could we consider that Sears in the seventies, Walmart in the eighties, Costco in the nineties, Amazon in 2000, we're all great disruptors at various times in history. Yes, I think that's true. All require sophisticated supply chain, logistics, transportation, all are meeting at the just, juxtaposition of the fundamental changes in consumer behavior, researching and transacting. Right, so as people have changed how they've looked for products and, and uh, how they've changed in behavior. You know, I remember man, when I was growing up, you know, or actually when my kids, I guess was, I was in college, malls were the place to go, right? And the generation behind me, everyone went to the malls and that was like a social thing, right? And now nobody does that. It's been replaced by social media. So that I think to some degree, technology has driven this and everybody in is, is uh, I think it's hard to imagine what comes next, right? But I mean, no company's dominance lasts forever. He did add what might be the void in the absence of the Amazon model. Okay, so I think he's asking, what what is it? What's the vulnerability for Amazon? I mean, I, I have an answer, but I'd be interested. To, uh, and I don't want to make this all about Amazon because I think, to your point, there are great other examples of you know threats and opportunities in the industry. But what is the void in that in the in the Amazon model? What do you mean void? Uh, what's, what's the, the weak, yeah. what's the vulnerability? Yeah, you know. Me personally, this is just my opinion. I think any wholesale distributor who wants to be in business, profitable business in five, 10, 15, 20 years can do it. Right. And, you know, Amazon, whomever, they're going to come along and they're going to do good and they, they amaze people with their service and so forth and so on. Um, but it is what it is. At some point, they're going to get too big like everybody else. Right. Um, so, Look, people can do what they can do. And I think that uh, the members of our organization know what they need to do. And hell, they can learn from Amazon and take some good things from them. But I would dare say Amazon could learn a whole lot more about serving the construction professional from our members than vice versa. So, you know, I can't control, none of us can, what anyone else does. We can control what we can. And there's enough information, enough smart people in this business um, you know, to figure out how to uh, do a good job. Now, I would say this, that the people working at a distributor in 10 years will be doing different kinds of work, have different kinds of job titles. Um, I think those businesses are going to change by definition and by desire. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, hey, it's America. And, uh, you know, you figure it out or you don't. Yeah, I agree. I mean, look, I think, you know, I think, Amazon's got a very niche fit. It's where you don't really need any help picking the product. Their search engine's crap, right? And they don't have anybody you can call. No one's ever phoned an order into Amazon. And 
you know, so I think you, if you know what you need, it, it, it's a good fit. Look, they've been very successful with what they do, but that's for the most part, not what distributor transactions look like. And so they're, they're in for a bit of a different, you know, equation in B2B, although they're going to take a lot of revenue. So we have another few more questions, actually. Um, Steve, great example on e -com. Where did the investment money come from to reward member companies who adopted? Oh, I don't know. The came from the rebate pool. Rebate pool. Okay. And then Brick wants to know, do you measure your members' capability going forward? Is there a metric they are graded on to keep them relevant in the future? I don't think I understand that question exactly. Do you know? Well, so so it's, I think it's like, it, if you look at a franchise, a uh, franchise makes sure that the, the, the Zs, the franchisees, um, have certain things in place. And so it could be as simple as marks, but it's also customer satisfaction capabilities, things like that. So are there, are there capabilities that you expect your members to have? And if so, how are you grading them? Well, the answer to that is no. Um, we are forming right now, in the, we're in the process of forming what is called a marketing technology committee. And this is a committee that's going to be made up of distributors and manufacturers. And the first thing we're going to do is a state of the marketing profession mm -hmm. survey. Yep. You know, where are our members in terms of how they engage with their customers? And, you know, from that, and along with the feedback from the people on the committee, you know, I think that there's the possibility of doing some sort of a roadmap that, pe that people can point to. Um, you know, when you work for an organization like iMark, there's this, you know, it's a kind of complicated animal. It's, it's following and responding, but also leadership, you know, when appropriate. The uh, e-commerce thing was an example of that. And I think marketing technology, I mean, the, the, there's a convergence. You, you can't do one without the other. Right. So what does, what are the elements of a best in class marketer? And that includes sales, right? Sales is part of marketing. Um, and is there a way for us to put that blueprint out for members and begin to measure it, encourage, maybe even reward, you know, those folks who, who do a particularly good job and, uh, those kinds of things generate very positive results for our members, at least those that, you know, want to get better. And there's a lot of them that do. Yeah, that's interesting because you have such a, a bell curve of marketing capability ranging from none to very sophisticated. So that, that'd, be, that'd be a very interesting and useful study, I think. Yes. Um, have you, con here's another question. Have you contracted or partnered with an e-com provider to serve your members? Well, what we did was uh, when we, it was very important for us to make sure that our members had good options when it came time to developing their capabilities. So, right. you know, we don't have, you know, we're not e-commerce geniuses here. We're, we're marketing group people. So we partnered with people who um, had expertise in the distribution channel. There's three sets of companies that are available to our members. They can go to our website and they can say who these companies are, what their capabilities are, what their price points are. And then the, it's up to the distributors to figure out which of those, if any, are the right foot fit for them in terms of moving forward. And that's presuming they don't have the expertise themselves. So um, we just want to give people uh, options that, if for no other reason, they could vet our options against other people that they were considering to be their technology partner. And, and that's worked well for us. We have a lot of friends in the industry and uh, they've stepped up and helped our members do what's right for them as, oppo as opposed to us kind of laying down this one size fits all, which as you point out, you know, couldn't work you know, for an iMark group with our various types of members. Steve, in terms of those, those folks that you're recommending, you did kind of standardize on the product data. I think what you're talking about is the PIM that they could use, the e-commerce platform, other aspects of that. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. The question was about e-commerce platform. Yeah, without going into too much details, one of the initiatives, uh, one of the partners was from second phase in trade service and mm -hmm. did include up to 400,000 fully attributed SKUs. Mm -hmm. okay? 
chosen by the members. But we have other partners who are relying on IDW data. Uh, we have a partner who's relying on the DDS uh, data. Um, so again, it's kind of up to the member to figure out, you know, what's right for them, what price point is acceptable to them. And then, uh, you know, we all know, it's all been driven into us, that high quality data, you know, is the uh, essential linchpin of a, a good user experience on any sort of web store. So, you know, I think the industry continues to make progress, but I think there's a ways to go in terms of having access to, you know, affordable data in one place. It's a journey, right? <laughs> yeah, it really is. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to wrap up here in a minute. Uh, Steve, anything else you want to leave the listeners with before we uh, uh, close up here for the day? No, it's just that, you know, I enjoy being part of the industry. I think it's a, a great industry and um, very optimistic about the future. You know, I think you, when you when you read about what people are doing or you talk to them, um, you know, they've got this. And, um, you know, we just got to keep at it not get complacent, which I don't think in any way, shape or form is a problem. Um, and we're looking forward to doing what we can do to support folks. That's it. Thanks for the time. Thanks for having me. Oh, you bet. We really appreciate you coming on. So there's uh, Steve's contact information. It's sruane at imarkgroup.com. I'm Ian Heller and my business partner, Jonathan Bine. His, uh, our phone numbers and email addresses are on there. This is the Wholesale Chain Show. We're on every other Wednesday, uh, most of the time at 12 noon. Nine Pacific. The next webcast is on February 3rd. We hope you'll join us then. Steve, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Thanks to all the people who participated. We appreciate your questions and I hope you all have a wonderful day and now get off to a hot start for 2021. Thank you everyone. Bye now.